My name is Chris Myers. I'm the Vice President of Partnerships for Igloo Software. Um, so before you got a koozie with Igloo printed on it, anybody in the room heard of Igloo before you came to the? That's just the cooler people, right? No, we're not the ones that make the coolers. Uh, ironically enough, we did give out in the gift bags, though, a uh, beer koozie. So we're trying to, trying to keep that theme going. That's right. Um, I'm joined by Sean Wilson. Sean, I'm going to introduce yourself. Yep, I'm Sean Wilson. I'm the Director of Solution Engineering at Igloo. They also call me Chief Pendo Officer, as I'm the one who did students and So I also have that title. I have an interesting background, graphic designer, and now I run kind of product management and that side of it. So we made a big switch. It was in a CS work, too. So I have a little bit of all the spectrums, which gives me a little perspective. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Igloo, um, since you guys just pre-associated us with beer and, uh, and coolers. I'll clarify that misconception. Uh, we'll talk about some of the parallels of onboarding employees and, uh, and, new, and users. Um, we have kind of a, a unique uh, perspective on Pindo because we not only do we use it in our freemium edition, but we also recommend it to our clients. Um, and then Sean will talk to you about some of the guiding principles uh, and, uh, and tips for optimization, and uh, we'll leave time for some Q&A. We've got a pretty small group here. Um, so Igloo is uh, about a 130-person company based in Kitchener, Ontario, which is about an hour and 20 minutes northwest of Toronto. Uh, we're an eight-year-old company, and we build intranets, uh, or digital workspaces. Um, so we've literally got hundreds of thousands of communities uh, built on our, our SaaS platform. Um, been recognized in the Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, seven years in a row, uh, part of Deloitte's Fast 50. Um, and, and like I said, it's, uh, the, the intranet market has evolved and, and largely stayed the same as well. I remember my, my first day in the workforce in uh, 1998, um, my first day as an employee at McLeod USA, which was a telco provider in the US. Um, my first day was go log on to the intranet and learn about what you need to do as an employee. And still today, we're talking to clients about a lot of those same things. Um, and while the technology and the platform has changed, obviously, uh, when I joined the workforce, it was largely on-prem. Uh, we've been a SaaS-based uh, application from inception and never done an on-premise implementation in the history of the company. Um, and and we, we build it to, to be that digital destination as to where employees go uh, to do their work. Um, now. A lot of the challenges that we talk to our clients about uh, are along these kind of four fronts. Um, so um, how do, from a corporate communications perspective, how does an organization commu effectively communicate uh, with their employees in this digital work space? Uh, a lot of companies come to us with the challenge of trying to replicate their brick and mortar culture in a digital workspace. So um, Sean had mentioned his background in graphic design. Obviously, branding is very important, uh, making sure that it reflects the company, the culture, things like that, uh, and trying to bring people together you know, and take down some of those functional silos that inherently grow in organizations, especially in today's organization, which is largely geographically diverse um, um, and, and so on, uh, and really kind of try to harness some of that collective knowledge. You, know, um, you always grow some tribal knowledge and everybody has a lot of this captured in your head or on your laptop or, or desktop or your mobile phones. And how do you share that with your peers uh, so that you don't have to be there for every decision and so forth? Um, I mentioned that we, we try to be that place where people go to do their work. We're also not so uh, maniacal that we try to build everything. So um, we are a neutral platform. Uh, and we try to welcome best of breed applications into, uh, into the platform. Um, and so I mentioned my role as VP of Partnerships. Um, I own three, three partner programs. I own our technology alliances, uh, which you see a lot of those rep uh, represented up here. Um, we're also in the process of building out a channel uh, who can build on our platform and take our product to market for us. Uh, and then we're also building a developer program that will likely launch in uh, the first part of July this year. Um, so, you know, a lot of people ask us, well, you know, you, don't you compete with SharePoint? Absolutely. We, we do compete with SharePoint, although if both of us are in the same opportunity, somebody's probably in the wrong room. Uh, they really address, um, you know, the 5,000 user and up. 
Uh, our core market is 200 to 5,000 users. Uh, we do have communities that, we have one community that's over 70,000 users in one uh, employee community. So we know the platform's stable enough. Um, there are significant competitive headwinds when you get into above that 500 user or 5,000 user market. Um, so if you looked at um, the representation of users in our client base, a lot of that 200 to 5,000 users is, is where we win. Uh, vertically speaking, um, hundreds of healthcare uh, clients, hundreds of non-banking financial service clients, a lot of high tech. Um, we may have some, some end users uh, here at the conference as well, so we do have a, a large concentration of users out in Silicon Valley. Um, so, you know, when we, uh, when we were talking with Mike Peach about uh, presenting this, you know, we kind of wanted to leverage our strengths and talk about what we know. And what we know because our clients are using, you know, uh, when they're launching a version uh, of Igloo, you know, a lot of the conversation is, well, how do we get adoption, right? What does onboarding look like? Uh, and because we have this unique perspective that not only we use it for our freemium edition and try to gather user data and guide users through a freemium experience, um, but we also look at onboarding from, well, how do you get your employees to adopt this digital workplace as you're launching a new intranet? Uh, and as we go through those, and, and Sean will expand on this, there are a lot of parallels that you as product owners can use from you know, how you would guide an employee and how you would guide a user to a new, uh, a new experience. Um, and so you know, we look at onboarding as the systematic approach to bringing a new person into a complex environment. So whether that's users or employees, a lot of the principles are the same. And, and uh, Sean will walk you through some of the guiding principles uh, that we use in both scenarios. Um, but I mentioned the parallel universe. You know, when a, when a new employee joins or when an organization launches a, a new intranet and you're trying to get mass adoption, uh, you're trying to address, you know, these, these three questions. You know, for employees, it's, you know, what am I expected to do? How am I expected to do it? And what tools can I use? Uh, for users, um, you know, a lot of their questions are, are similar in what does it do, how do I do it, and what features are available to me? Um, so, but you know, at the end of the day, the, the goal is always to incre increase the speed uh, in which a user or an employee is efficient, proficient, and, and completing the objectives and the tasks. Um, and so now Sean's gonna walk you through some of those five guiding principles that, uh, that are parallels in both scenarios. So some of the guiding principles. So what I'm gonna walk through here is, well, how do you onboard? How do you onboard new users? How do you onboard new employees? I'll give a little bit of a story about how we kind of do it. Um, and then I'll give you some tips in Pendo too. Uh, they'll be very light because you've probably gone through most of them. But guiding principle number one, uh, and this one's really hard for some businesses to swallow, but it's actually about the individual and not the business. So yes, you have business objectives that are kind of guiding what you're gonna onboard someone to do. You have to let that individual get the knowledge and get the information that they need in order to meet those business objectives. So effective onboarding kind of lets them, the faster that the end user sees success, the faster that your business is gonna see success. Um, one size rarely fits all. Um, and by that we mean if you look at adult learning principles, if you look at the way that people understand and learn something, everybody is different. And the great thing about Pendo is you can control their experience, you can control who they are, and you can present all that information in a way that makes sense to them. So new users and new employees, they have different roles and objectives. So what someone in marketing is trying to do and learn when they first start versus what someone in sales, they're gonna be different, they're gonna have new tools. Um, typical person has about 32 different tools that they use in their workday, whether it's their email, whether it's Slack, whether it's all those. How do you actually onboard somebody onto all these tools that are sometimes outside of your control? Well, it's really leveraging what the business objectives are out of there. Keep it short. So this is kind of goes back to 101 in learning theory. It's a user only has so much time that they're gonna do this. Um, trading off initial productivity prof for proficiency is a small window. Um, everyone wants to make a splash when they start a new job. All new users want to have some form of measurable action when they're starting. Um, think about your first week at your job. Um, were you going to sit through and read every single manual and every single thing that was given to you? 
or were you trying to read what made you the most kind of efficient quicker? So it really is about keeping it short and making sure that you're using short walkthroughs, giving them short bursts of information so that they can get the job done faster. Um, breaking it up, so again, keeping it short is very similar, um, but if you have a lot of content, sometimes you can't kind of reduce, so you need to make sure that you're chunking that information out, using videos, using different guides, using different walkthroughs, but segmenting your content into smaller chunks of information will actually help someone in the long run. So although you might not be giving them everything they need in day one, if you break it out for the whole week and actually systematically walk them through, they're actually going to get more out of it because you're not overwhelming them. Um, you've all had that moment probably in this conference where you sat through, what, six hours of sessions now and you're trying to remember absolutely everything. Um, and I guarantee you if you go through your notes, you've kind of written little short sentences that will cue you. Do the same for your end user. Make sure that you're giving them enough context, but letting them consume it in a way that makes sense for them. Uh, and again, I apologize, because you've probably heard this a million times, but launch, measure, evolve, and repeat. You're not going to get it right the first time. And when you get it right, there's always a next phase. And if there isn't a next phase, then you've stopped innovating. So yes, you, you want to always strive to reach your goals, but you always want to continuously evolve those goals. So as your users kind of evolve and change the way that they work, as your employees start to get on board, um, we at Igloo have actually an, a year-long onboarding. So there's a first day, a first week, a first month, a first quarter, a first year, because there's always something you're going to be striving to. Yes, we get a little bit shorter in the types of content that we're presenting there, but it makes sense that you're continuously giving them learnings that they want. And then when something doesn't work, change it. There's nothing wrong with actually making something work. And I know that some, sometimes seems like a weird concept, because business units are, we put all this effort into making these guides, or we put all this effort into this strategy, and it didn't work. So the nice thing about Pendo is when it comes to onboarding, you can learn after one user. So you'll be able to see how that person did, and then understand where the other users are going to go. Um, the nice thing about Pendo, again, is the analytics that are behind it. You've probably heard this all day long. Um, but these are the five that are kind of make the most sense when you're onboarding. It's the breadth. So how many active users do I have? So when I'm onboarding, you really want to know kind of how quickly these people are doing it, how many active users are going to be on there. Um, because it, there's a difference if you have two people onboarding in your company or 30 people. There's a difference in the way that you're going to present that content. The depth, so how much of the community are they actually using? If they're only using one page, your onboarding experience is very different than like a 30 kind of page website or trying to make them understand all the breadth of that tool. Frequency, how much are they logging in? Different industries, different users, different anybody who's onboarding will be logging in at different times. So for instance, a consumer of content will only log in however they need that content. But creators might be kind of pushed to log in more, be on there frequently. So it's understanding who these people are and making sure that you're presenting them with that content. Efficiency, how hard is it for users to complete tasks? Probably all of you who have done guides know that that's a very important fact. And satisfaction, how, how do employees kind of rate the experience? So with new users and new employees, you often have feedback loops, you, you have polls, you have ways of understanding it to make that experience better for the next people. So it's really about understanding all of those. What I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about how this helped Igloo. Um, so Chris had mentioned we have a free trial of our product. Our product is very robust. If you saw some of the slides where we have four different categories that we're in, we're in every different industry. We have 10 users to like 70,000 users. So we have a lot of different things available in our platform. And we're a growing company and we're bringing on people all the time. So how do we make sure that people know how to use our platform? And how do we know that our employees can actually, you know, help their customers or make sure that they're actually knowledgeable in what they're selling or implementing. Um, we needed b better visibility into those behaviors because they are different in terms of how someone is going to behave. Um, and we needed a dynamic way to promote call to action. So if you're stuck, we want to know. If you're not stuck and you're kind of wanting to know more information, those are very different call to actions that we want to be able to present to you. Um, so our original strategy was to just use guides and walkthroughs 
Um, we weren't using a lot of what we needed for a free trial. We were just trying to see how people were using it. Our sales team believed that they could convert people just by talking to them. As most people know, that that's not often the case. You really do need a free trial experience. Um, and we were focused on the breadth and depth. So how much of the actual community of the free one that we have that they were going to and kind of how deep they were going into the knowledge of what they needed to do. Um, we were completely wrong. So <laughs> we implemented Pendo and we used the analytics to actually prove that they're different. So in terms of we learned that our free users didn't care about the 30 some odd pages that we had in the community. They were concerned about, but it doesn't look like my company. So they weren't even getting to any other pages. All they were concerned about was, well, our brand is red and this one's blue, or our logo isn't on there. And to a lot of companies, that makes a huge difference in the selling process. New employees, they got lost in the site because there was too much. They didn't know what to focus on. Um, and before Pendo, we didn't have analytics to separate those two. So what was happening was our data set was using both new employees and new users and intermixing them together. So all of our data feeds and all of our background analytics were completely skewed because we had two different types of people and types of users in one stream. So decisions that we were making were based on wrong data. And it wasn't until we got Pendo that really allowed us to excel there. Um, and it, it allowed us to refocus our strategies. If you can see on the right there, um, when I said that they had struggles with personalization, this is where we used guides to actually walk them through branding their own community. So we actually input some JavaScript into a guide, which allowed them to drag and drop a logo off of their desktop, and it would rebrand the site based on that. They could actually go and change colors of their community just by doing a guide. So instead of having one person on our implementation team getting their hex code, which is their color, and going and changing it all for them, we had one field in the site that allowed them to go in and actually change what it was. Um, so that's a really important thing in the selling journey when they're going into a presentation to their board and they easily uploaded their logo, their color, and it made it look like they had an entire website or community dedicated to their brand. So instead of having us do it, we made them do it and we made it kind of fun for them so that they wanted to do it. Um, and this really helps with our stats because within the first week of implementing those new guides, we had 95% personalized communities. The 5%, um, that's a typical number where you get drop off. They just logged in, didn't realize it wasn't for them, or actually got their own branded site from our sales team. So we actually had a really high number. We also had increased volume uh, pricing requests, calls with sales, and weekly webinar attendance. So just in shifting the kind of strategy behind what guides we have, we actually controlled where they were going. When the sales team got them, they knew kind of what their needs were because we could track, oh, they spent a lot of time in the knowledge area. You might want to start with like solving their knowledge challenges. So it made us smarter, it made our customers smarter because if they landed on that knowledge page, we could present them with different best practices or tips or tricks or here's what you might actually want to do, which if you can already become trusted advisors for your customers in the sales cycle, it makes their implementation a whole lot easier. Um, so optimizing with Pendo, uh, you guys have heard this all day now probably and all day yesterday and you're going to continue to hear this tomorrow. Um, but things that really helped us, there was four really good tips for us and it was tagging. And I know if you sat in 101 yesterday, you learned how to tag. Um, we have unique challenges with tagging because we're a completely customizable interface. So it's drag and drop. So when you have CSS and you tag an item and that end user goes and changes it, it no longer registers. But the really good thing is you only care about that one point in time when they're logging on there. Because if they have customized it and drag and dropped it and moved where that anchor was, they've done the job that that anchor was telling them to do. So what I would encourage you to do is just load up your site if you haven't. Tag absolutely everything. Even if you don't think it's going to be important, tag it anyway because that's where you start learning. Our advanced customized area, so we have a little cog in the top where we didn't think a lot of people went in free. It's one of the highest visited areas of our site. Yes, Pendo retroacts all your data, but it wasn't, if we didn't tag that, we wouldn't have been reactive and be able to change it like we did. 
Um, and then step-by-step -step guides. Obviously, guides are everyone's favorite tool. This is where you're walking people through. If you saw what we did, we had guides originally where it was, here's all the areas in everything. But really what we needed was, here to, here's how to make it your own. Here's everything that you need to do to make this feel like your place of work. Almost as comfortable as you walking into the office, it's you logging onto this screen, which is a really important thing for us uh, and for the end users. Um, make relevant announcements. So I was very excited to see the new announcements about kind of <laughs> the release notes today or being able to push new features. That's actually going to change the way we work. So since that kind of announcement happened, I've been drafting a strategy of how we would actually use Pendo to launch new features for our end users. And the nice thing is, is they don't have to be new features that your company is doing. We actually choose on our free trial to limit functionality, and this allows us to now introduce functionality throughout the right stages of it. So again, if we have these enterprise customers who are on this trial, or prospects, or and they're on this trial, we want to be able to control, hey, you've been on this for two weeks, you've made it past these stages of it, we're now going to present you with this that says customize this further or continue talking to us. So it's really important for us to be able to have that communication within there. And for you guys, it's really important to make sure that you're having those right conversations. Uh, I always get asked kind of who, who owns those conversations. Um, I'm in product strategy, and I actually work with both sales, marketing, and implementation, and we kind of cross-pollinate to make sure that we have the right messages in there. Um, make suggestions and showcase uh, new functionalities based on behaviors. This was something that there was a whole session on, and it was kind of understanding behaviors of your end users and using segments to make sure that you're actually targeting the right, se like the right people. Because um, again, for us, if we didn't delineate between a new employee of Igloo and a new end user of Igloo, we would have never known that there was two personas that were using our onboarding experience. So we got through that quickly because we know it's late. Um, and it really is about Q&A. Um, we know a lot about Pendo, but we also have various onboarding. So at Igloo, again, we onboard new users, we onboard new customers, we offer onboarding solutions, um, and we have all of our free. Does anybody have any onboarding challenges at their companies? I was a little confused on how you have an intranet within the SaaS environment. It seems <coughs> counterintuitive. So, what do you mean by counterintuitive? Because basically nowadays everything's in the cloud. Yep. Yeah, so we're, we meet basically all of the right security standards for that. We're SOC 2 compliant. We have a higher uptime than a lot of other kind of companies in the cloud. But basically we're trusted by a lot of our customers to be that security provider. Um, the nice thing about it having it in the cloud and not being on-prem is it can, we can literally iterate all the time. So whereas SharePoint, one of our competitors and a little bit of our partner, they're able to have an on-prem one. Why we win out is because we can change. We're a SaaS. We're developing new functionality for an intranet. Um, we're embracing all how people want to work. We have mobile apps. So Chris and I, we've been out here. We haven't been disconnected the entire time that we're here because we're basically on our intranet. So it's, it's a new way of thinking about intranets, but it's proven really successful for us. Um, so after you guys started segmenting out yep. the onboarding end users and onboarding employees, were there any like similarities that you still saw between how those two audiences were approaching this world for the first time? Or? Yeah, well there's an initial learning curve where both audiences typically explore for the first little bit. So they're, they're kind of going in and seeing everything that's possible. And then both of them probably have the same realization that, wow, this is overwhelming. And it's not until then that they understand, let's start small and really escalate through this. And whether I'm going, hey, I'm a new employee, I need to know everything possible, but take me through it in a way that's manageable, versus a new end user, typically in the freemium case, it's how much do I need to know to be competent enough to talk to their salespeople, but also be able to present back to my company and make sure that it's the right solution for me. Just out of curiosity, what's, what was your biggest surprise once you were able to segment you know, users from, from employees? 
I was surprised how much time our employees were dedicating to their onboarding experience. So when we segmented it off, we thought that our end users were in the communities for longer because we thought our employees were doing their, it ended up being that our employees were spending more time than end users were. Um, and it was employees that were actually in freemium sites with their customers, but also doing their employee experience. So we actually had two different segments for employees. One was anybody who was, had been there less than three months, and the other one was anybody who was in a customer-facing role that also played activity in, a, in their kind of free trial site. Oh yeah, yeah, so our employees spent a lot more time in the nitty-gritty of all of the different configuration options, whereas our end users spent more time in terms of what they could present. So we have a lot of different configuration in the background that lets you, I want to present it this way or I want to do that, um, which is what employees want to know because if a customer asks them, can I do this, can I do that, versus the end user was really focused on like, I want to make it look like my site. I want to look, make it look, so they spent a lot more time in in the more visual areas, which is not what we expected when we started off. We thought that they would want to know feature functionality, but they wanted to know the shiny pretty of what they could do. So, yeah. uh, so a question as far as, um, like just from a build out standpoint, so yeah. obviously, you know, when we say employees, that's a lot of different roles. Um, you know, what a sales engineer needs to know to do their job is going to be different from a technical account manager, which is different from someone in the ops. Mm -hmm. um, as far as with you guys, like, do you, like, currently do you kind of have like a one size fits all thing, or did you, do you have like a specific experience for role? And if so, how long does that take? Did it kind of stress me out? Just gonna sit there again. <laughs> <laughs> We're lucky that in the case of onboarding new employees, it's all pretty one size fits all because you need to know like the base of the platform. So when we talk about new employee onboarding, it's like competency to be able to talk to it. There's another stage after that that's more complex based on your role. So it really when we, it's just the general, like what does a new employee need to know about our platform? Because I mean like if you, like I'm in solutions engineering and product strategy, and if I don't know more about the platform than maybe someone in like the other roles, there's a difference. And what I need to know is actually different because I need to know more about kind of the ins and outs of the technical side of it, how people are using it, versus your CSM probably just wants to know about some of the light questions that they're gonna get asked, some of the more configurable options. So we have this kind of 101 where it's like, here's everything kind of that will make you competent, and there's the advanced training where it's like you get whipped into shape and you create your own community from scratch. So. Well, as, as I mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, as I mentioned, we recommend Pendo to our clients as well, right, so that they can have on their individual communities. And, and one of the customers that's considering putting Pendo on their community, um, you know, they're talking about nine different functional onboarding paths to align with the nine functional groups within there. And then they have a phase two of that, which is, well, we're going to have nine functional onboarding paths, and then we're going to have three roles in every functional group, right, based on level and seniority and things like that. So, I mean, I, I would say that the complexity of your organization probably guides the complexity of you know, that onboarding. How granular you want to get? I mean, I'm sure for our customers it's 70,000. That's a pretty big tree of potential onboarding paths. Where we're a 130 person company, where we all wear very you know, diverse hats, and so you can kind of genericize the onboarding experience. Anyway. Are you using you know, your work email yeah, well, so again, because we're 130 people, I typically, if it comes from our, our kind of igloosoftware.com email, we know. Um, but typically there's a different, we have different forms that someone gets a trial from. So I automatically know that if they come from this form, it's a different user. So we just, we segment it that way. We only have English. Um, we have a bilingual platform. Um, in our free experience, um, you get only English. It's only when you become a customer that you get the, the additional languages on there, and we'll support that when you get your implementation. Um, so far, we haven't had any 
like double language pendo igloo ones. It's kind of a fringe case for us, but we'll look to that challenge when it comes. <laughs> 90 plus percent of our customers are US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. So it's using free trials, especially guides that kind of this dual purpose where they're both marketing and instructive. Can you talk about some best practices or observations, like how far do you find you actually need to drill down to those features, or is it enough to just kind of say, hey, this exists? For us, it's a little bit tricky. Um, we have nine core apps. There's about four that we go into a little bit more detail on, and then there's five that are like, we just announce that they're there. So it really depends on kind of what you want their core competency to be. For us, it's actually the less time they spend in freemium, the better. So we have call to actions throughout our free trial experience, and the second somebody hits it, they get to our sales team. Um, and then our sales team typically says, you are no longer on this free trial experience, you are on this special Igloo sales trial experience. Well, they will guide you through it. So it's a little bit just of like a, oh, now you get a guided coach throughout the whole thing. So we actually rely on that sales team to do it um, because we offer a free version of our product. So this free version is free for one to 10 people. It's on the same community as our free version. So whether you're starting off and saying, I'm just getting a free community, or I'm trying it to be for my enterprise software, you get the same version of our product. So for us, we have to have the kind of bare minimum end user training in there, but still being able to drive larger marketing campaigns through the in-app guides and messaging. Can you simply like roll out the guides gradually over the course of like a year? Yeah. Like how did you work on that strategy and like so we're only four months into that. <laughs> so <laughs> I have the long-term strategy of the whole year. So basically, I know if they're, again, an end user or an end employee. End users, I don't really put too much time in because if they're an end user on a free trial and they've been on there for four months, the likelihood of me converting them is very low. We have a very short kind of time for our sales team. So for new employees, um, we really just know. We're, we're eight years into the business of doing our business. We've done this one thing. We're very good at knowing what to present to people when. So it's come from our HR department. It's come from employees saying, I wish I had this then. Or at even just us understanding like how much of our product you can actually consume in a short amount of time. So we, we set goals as to, hey, it's six months. I want you to be able to do this. Here's all the ways I'm going to get you there. So we really define what our objectives are and do a little bit of a work back and make sure that we're not crowding them with this week. You're going to have a million things that you're going to need to do. So we'll just kind of translate it over a shorter amount of time. It's a whole keep it short and break it up thing. If it's too much in one week, send them to the next. It seems like you must have like a lot of guys that you manage Nintendo. Like if you have to make a change or like an overall kind of like something like, is it a pain to go through like, every single guy and update them? That's something that we're struggling with. Yeah. Yes and no. Um, I'm one person, so I, I'm actually the only one that controls it in the whole company. I don't suggest this at all, because it's like this much of what I have to do. Um, but we try and keep it really short, and we try and actually stack them on top of each other. So one guide will actually take you a long time. We'll actually have components and say, go back and launch it in the menu. So because it's internal employees, we don't have to have the high standard of a public facing thing. So if it's like language tweaks or it, it doesn't really matter as much. So, and again, I know who's on what. So <laughs> if, I, if there's an issue, I'll go walk over and say, hey, sorry, <laughs> this is what I meant. <laughs> but it, it's pretty easy actually. Like we don't find it that unmanageable. Um, again, we're 130 people. Last year we brought in, I think it was we had 50 people brought in in the last year, so. How many years? A year and a bit? Uh, it was there when I got there 10 months ago, so yeah. over a year. Yeah, I think it's uh, been a year and a bit. Um, we explored it before, um, so I had the luxury of actually inheriting Pendo, so I didn't have to go through any of the battle of selling it. I got this shiny thing put on my plate and said, have fun, and I went to town, so.
Yeah. Yeah. We have the luxury of being a pretty high-end tech company. So even people in marketing, I trust them with going in. And I have like rules on rules. So it's like just it's easy. It's just guides <laughs> at this point. We have it all built out. Um, and like we did some pretty complex things in there with like JavaScript to be able to inject things. I had no part in like the coding behind that. I just said, this would be cool, and someone did it. So that's always a nice challenge. Like it's a nice thing to have in your company, understanding that if you don't have that, Pendo is a great resource because they'll set you up with people who can. Any last questions? What led you guys to start doing this? Sorry? The employee onboarding via Pendo, like as far as, I don't know if it was something that needed to like, be like, sold to executives or anything. Like, like how did you say like, this would be the value of doing um, So I used to be in customer success and I used to be everyone's go-to person. So I was kind of sick of being everyone's go-to person. So I figured the smarter employee that we make, the less that I have to do. So I'm really trying to work myself out of a job. That's what I do in every role is just try and automate it enough to make it easy. All right, well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it.